right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to our panel on, of, uh, of Red Team Block. So I'm going to start with a few questions dedicated to our two speakers. And then I'm going to go more to general Red Team questions, uh, if we have time. So I will start with you, Olivier. Um, we had some questions about RDP. Uh, of course, RDP is very well used in the industry. It's built in on Windows. You can use it on Linux. You can use it on Mac. Uh, the question was, are there better alternatives to RDP? Um, I would say wrap RDP in an SSH tunnel. <laughs> but that, that might not be convenient. That might be a bit of a troll. Um, no, I think, so I think this is the standard. It's, it's really efficient. So there are some proprietary alternatives. Uh, and if you, the problem is you need to control the server and the client. You need the flexibility. You need the deployment. So it kind of makes sense that it is in Microsoft's control. Um, so it's a difficult question, uh, and I think it relies on a lot of things. But like, let's say I would be, I don't know, I, 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 I just don't, I control all my computing. I don't, I don't care about anyone, and I don't need to because let's say I'm CSC, something like that, right? The, our secret service. Then, okay, just use something else and enforce it and make sure you audit it properly because RDP has been audited a lot, right? But if you are anyone else than Secret Service, I mean, you must pretty much use RDP and using something else. Uh, it might not have been scrutinized as well as RDP. So no, I think my advice today still holds is wrap it in something else, wrap it in VPN, um, keep monitoring it, and maybe uh, maybe you know speak with Devolution and I and I don't. No, I'm plugging a vendor here, but they really understand it. And look at, at, at what they're trying to do to make sure that it's secure. And if, if you can't do VPN or if it's too clunky, too complicated. But there are also other vendors doing that. But if you want uh, to avoid additional costs, I think just VPN and making sure that nothing is exposed uh, is a good step. And keep patching. Keep patching. All right. Thank you uh, for Roland. Do you have insights on which type of domains, like big tech, large orgs, brands, that you got the most amount of emails from? Um, I don't want to single out any single provider, but I will say that in general, um, it's a it's a it's a game of it's a numbers game. So, the more keystrokes and the more attempts, I guess, to communicate with the domain name system, the more likely you're going to land on a typo squat. Um, so the longer the domain, the more likely it is that there's a typo in it. And the more, in this case, emails are being sent, uh, the more likely it is one of those is going to be a typo. Um, so I would say think about the big providers that have millions and millions of emails going through every, every second, every minute. Uh, and typically, the longer the domain, the more likely it is there, there's going to be a typo in it. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, next one for Olivier. Um, in your research, it, uh, I don't know if you read about MS Remote Desktop Services, which encapsulate RDP into HTTPS. Uh, do you know if it resolved many of the problems you presented today? I honestly thought that this was RD Gateway. So uh, I had, I. I think it is RD Gateway. Does the person who asked the question still here? Because if it is RD Gateway, then it was in my future work slide. <laughs> so if it was not, if it's not RD Gateway, then I want to hear about it. But uh, no, honestly, I think this is uh, the, the so the remote desktop services. You can enable a gateway which encapsulated in HTTPS. And so for the the um, NLA at, uh, NTLM attack, it means yes. But now, how have they implemented it? If they have implemented it b by just layering HTTP on top of it, then as soon as I get to implement that in PyRDP, I'll have access. And if they haven't changed anything, and they have no reason to have changed the underlying protocol, it's just another encapsulation, uh, I believe that our attack will still work. But right now it doesn't, because we need to do that uh, HTTPS decapsulation. Mm. And to be honest, that code is so complex. The guy, are, are they still here? That code is so complex and hard to maintain that I, if I ever <laughs> keep up with it, 
I might attack it, but I, I or I, I'll need other interns to do it for me because I'm, I'm not that bright. Okay, it's sad, but I'm aging. <laughs> so next question would be for Rola. Um, so you, you mentioned how to do typo squatting, but let's say you are being typo squatted. So what would you recommend to blue teamers in the room? Sure, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the first thing is to be aware that it's happening. It's really easy to look around uh, DNS. There's lots of good tools out there. Uh, DNS, come, DNS Twist comes to mind. It's a, a free Python uh, script on, on GitHub. You can find it for free. There's a lot of web uh, implementations of it as well if you're not into running Python. Um, so just being aware that it's happening to your domain is, is interesting enough. Um, and then you can start filtering for it and looking for instances of it. Uh, you can use tools like dig, nslookup, and just see what, what, what kind of records are on that domain name. Um, if there's an MX record, uh, that, that's a red flag. Um, just being aware that it's there, and uh, you can do a lot to protect yourself uh, and your users from reaching out to that domain but it, it's really hard to, to, to police everybody on the internet from looking for that domain. Um, so I guess the next best thing is depending on who you are and how much leverage you have and where the domain is, is registered, uh, you, could, you could try to do a takedown request if it's a brand infringement. Um, I, I think the key is first understanding if, if somebody's doing it, simply uh, you know, I, I, would, I would recommend looking at a tool like DNS Twist um, is probably a good place to start. Okay. May, may I uh, add an additional question? Do you know if they are provisioned to, like, so we know that you can't uh, purchase, like, uh, Nestle uh, because it's a brand that is a trademark, right? But do you know if typo squatting kind of falls under the trademark uh, infringement stuff? Um, I'll say that from what I've seen, there are definitely efforts out there to police it, but I think it's on a registrar by registrar basis. I think it's going to depend on the TLD. Um, there's a lot of factors at play, but generally, um, if, if it is being policed, it's not being policed very well. I, I think it's incumbent on the trademark owner to actually fight to go and have that domain revoked. And they do have a lot of power. There's a lot of levers in place for, for brands to protect their, their trademark that way. Um, I think it's a mixed bag about whether or not y you'll be allowed to register it in the first place. But so you, sorry, uh, Martin, no. you typo squat pretty big uh, names, right? Yes. <laughs> and you got nothing. You, uh, you no like problems. no one kicked your door or you not, know. Not yet. After the talk, maybe we'll see what happens. But um, no, not yet. For 45 days. So uh, I'll say that I'll say that those domains have been registered and active for a lot longer than what I started working with them. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of conversations now about what do we do? What's the responsible thing to do with the domains? Um, so I'm open to discussions. If anybody has ideas, I, I have ideas about it as well. But um, yeah, so far, uh, got away with it. Okay. I'm going to jump. I, I had some, uh, I had a pocket question about, uh, you know, legal, legal concern of, uh, of the, your both research. So I, I'm going to, I'm not, I, I'm just going to jump on, I am on this question. Um, so are there legal concerns about doing typo squatting uh, on a specific company? Uh, is it considered as attacking this company? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a really good question, and I've lost a lot of sleep over it recently, especially knowing that I'm going to present it in a very public <laughs> forum. <laughs> um, I think yes. I think depending on what you're doing with it, I, I don't think owning the domain is necessarily enough to, to call it a criminal act or an illegal act. I think depending on what you do with it and how you use it, maybe. Um, is it illegal to steal mail from somebody's mailbox? Um, is this the same thing? Uh, I think there's a lot of questions about it. I think intent is important. If, uh, I mean, if I'm in front of a judge and saying, oh, I, I really wanted those e-transfers, that's one thing. But if, if it's for security research, I, I would like to think anyway that we have a society that um, wants us and encourages us to point these things out and try to correct them. Um, so, I, I mean, in, in my case, it's a risk I'm, I'm willing to take. Uh, I'm not going to share data with anybody. I'm not going to talk about personal information. Uh, and I would discourage anybody from trying this. It's already been proven. You can do it. You don't need to do it at home. <laughs> um, in the case of a red team engagement, a great tool. Um, I think awareness is probably key. So I, I think, yeah, it should be illegal. But how do you enforce it? How do you police it? Those are the bigger questions. Mm. I agree. And all you would like to add on this? Uh, <laughs> no? 
No, thanks for asking, though. But it was very, a very good question, and it's, it's a very difficult situation. I agree. I agree, too. Okay. Uh, I work a lot with the Cyber Threat Intel team, and most of the companies base their security prioritization based on threat actors with documented activities. So I was wondering if you have, for your both research, uh, used uh, such Intel. Have you seen attacks like that been made by, for example, ransomware or publicly known groups uh, in their campaign, in their TTP? You want to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah? So recently, the Okta breach, which we heard about, was RDP. So yeah, I removed the, that from the slide, unfortunately. But uh, I mean, it was just a screenshot saying, hey, RDP is important, Okta. But uh, yeah, no, so RDP is attacked. And uh, there's a lot of IPs out there. And some of, this, some of the, them are my honeypots. So you know, I'm increasing the number of exposed RDP systems. But uh, it's used, and it's a low-hanging fruit, and it's brute forceable. So of course, and and you know the ransomware groups, they're going after low-hanging fruit. Um, but in the Okta case, they purchase credentials on a forum, and then you leverage them. And there's a, there are RDP credentials for sale on forums. So yeah, yes, it's real. It's used, um, and it's. It's not going to go away, but uh, I mean, stop exposing RDP. Uh, um, in my case, uh, what, what I can say for sure is that there are a lot of, I mean, I spoke about it a little bit in my slides, uh, just from the three sample domains I looked at. Uh, I think it was over 400 different domains with active MX records um, that were nonsense domains that don't have real services that I'm aware of behind them. Uh, the bigger question is who's behind them and what are they using them for? I think the part of my talk that uh, was most interesting and I think impactful for me is that it's a passive technique. I can stand up a mail server uh, completely anonymously on a VPS anywhere in the world and, and I can receive these emails. What I do with them, I think, you know, um, a as an attacker, I think that's something that needs to be researched. Uh, maybe canary tokens and sending things out to these, these addresses and just seeing what happens. I'm, I'm really curious about that question as well. Um, and I don't know who's behind them. Uh, it would be interesting to see. Uh, I don't know of any known cases other than other research I've seen on the subject, but um, I, I don't doubt that it's happening, um, would be my take on it. OK. Uh, thank you. A uh, quick question for Olivier about RDP. Did you, did you, do you know if two-factor authentication or multiple-factor authentication would mitigate uh, or well, we'll mitigate what you just presented uh, this afternoon. So I think it depends on how it's implemented. Uh, and I haven't looked at implementations. I would be interested in knowing popular free ones, because I don't want to pay for a service to just attack it. Um, but um, I, let's, let's assume that it's a pin added at the end of your password. Uh, then the uh, net and TLM capture would work, but the hash would potentially be harder to crack un unless you know that is the NIP appended and then you add that to your cracking rules. Uh, so this would still work. But is this how they implement um, uh, two-factor for RDP? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. But I mean, I, I needed to ask, but uh, it's fair. I think it's a fair answer. Uh, now we're going to talk about honeypots um, because it's a field that is growing in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, there are some companies that dedicate, uh, they, they really make products that make it easy to deploy honeypots. So I think PyRDP is a great project to build honeypots. Uh, probably the, there will be probably something to do with uh, with uh, with your your work, uh, Rala. But. Uh, uh, do you think it would be a great idea to, to use PyRDP for honeypots and literally have, uh, let's say, uh, sophisticated actors with breadcrumbs, with you, you put some hints, you put some password on the network and have them reach your server and monitor it? What do you think about that? I think this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> no, but the, the problem is that, uh, like, lately we, we had... Um, we had actor interact with our honeypots, and I, I, we, 
some of the attacks, they kind of stopped doing them. And then I was like, why is so? And uh, looking at the replay, I, I was like, OK, they're transferring a large amount of files. So um, I, I reproduced it. And uh, it turns out we have a bug. So the, the transfer really slows down. Uh, I'm sh not sure quite what this is, but I think that we're so eagerly fetching client-side files that even on a stat system call, so the equivalent of a stat system call, but like I want to know the size of the file and I want to know the, um, the permissions, for example, we are get grabbing the file. So if the person mounts a drive with a lot of stuff on it and then grab drops uh, with thousands of files, you know, drops a folder. Well, explorer.exe will do a stat on all these files in order to just show how long the transfer will be. But PyRDP in the middle is doing just like whoop, 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 whoop. I want all of them. And so I, we have issues to work on regarding that. So unfortunately, I haven't caught. But we know, we, so we've seen the minor. Um, uh, the, uh, crypto miner stuff being transferred and stuff like that. But we do have um, scalability uh, things to look at. Also, uh, for example, like uh, on, a, um, let, on a typical week, we'll have like 17,000 replay files to look at. So I really have a triage problem. The problem with those replay files is that they are all unique and binary, but because they are all unique, and even if you hash them, they're all unique because there are timestamps in that protocol. So I need to find a way, and, and uh, Lisandro was working on that actually not so long ago, but we need a way to uh, factor out all of the timestamping and the, the bits of the protocol we don't care about, and then focus on the interesting things. Because the, the other thing I want to do with those honeypots, uh, more so than finding threat actors, is finding also uh, attacks, like uh, potential zero days or, you know, Blue Keep and stuff like that. We do have Blue Keep detections, and we do, do have detection for a couple of them built in. But but um, but like, why did the protocol fail, or who is this? What tool is this guy using that is creating this kind of interaction uh, at the protocol level? So uh, we're all looking at that, but it's a shit ton of work, and I'm have a small team, and we're not making money with any of this. So this is why it's slow. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, all right, I'm going to jump into more high-level questions uh, about red teaming, the, the field in general. Just do your best, uh, guys. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. So my first question would be, based on your work, what do you think is the cybersecurity industry's best next move? Uh, th that's, yeah, that's, that's a really kind of big question, I think. Um, the next best move for the cybersecurity industry, I think, is train more people. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of uh, need in cybersecurity, and not necessarily experts of a super high caliber, but um, there's a lot of work, and just grunt work that goes into research, whether it's going through honeypot files or uh, looking at stats and, and email collection. And there's a lot of work that can be done, and I think there's a lot of interest um, in the field. And I think uh, hire more people is probably the, the first thing I would say is the next best thing we can do, train more people. I'm glad you finished but by, with train, because hiring more people is yeah. tough right now. <laughs> OK, I'll try. This is, uh, this is super accurate and good. Uh, I'll try to do go in a different direction. Um, OK, so during the pandemic, something that I was not doing a lot that I started doing again is play D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons. And I'll, I'll link it with cybersecurity. So one of the first things, uh, not the first, one of the latest offerings of my company is uh, tabletop exercises for threat simulation. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, what I liked when I heard that is that we are now in a state where we are assuming breach. We, we, we no longer think we're going to protect them. We are assuming breach, but now we are testing you. How are you going to react? And you know, what's the drill? Do you have plans? And this can be done in a simulated way without much cost. And, and what's interesting is that you can go deeper and then validate it one day. We'll, va you, you know, we'll have red teamers validate the plans. But for most organizations, and we deal with medium-sized companies and smaller companies, but for most of them, sitting down with smart people who you know, play some corporate D&D, &D, you know, okay, let's 
simulate like, oh, you, this user received an email and clicked on that link. What's your visibility? Uh, what, uh, it was downloaded. What do you have on your endpoint? You know, and, th and then you just go through this mental exercise. And then eventually you say like, oh, the computer is getting encrypted. What are the map drives that are you know, accessible to that computer? And you just you know, play, you, know, you even could roll some dice if you want. You know? uh, like, oh, this, the, the N drive was encrypted. I, talk, I had eight. You know? I, I, I mean, I'm making this shit up. I know, I don't, and I'm not doing the service. It probably doesn't look like that at all. But to me, it sounds like interesting. And then you can, uh, you know, this is very effective and low cost because it's just a long half hour, half day meeting of simulation. And then imagine the client has a long list of stuff to look at. He was like, I couldn't answer half of the questions. And so then you come back and then you iterate. So I think we, we are at a maturity level where we can get a, a lot done and effectively done to get better by, by knowing how long to spend and then buying the things that will protect us, you know? But not, not buy first because you have uh, CapEx, you know? Use humans to buy intelligently products instead. And I think this is where we should go. Awesome, awesome answer. Uh, I was gonna talk about purple teaming. I think uh, the industry really needs uh, purple team exercise. They shouldn't pay for big red teams just for you know, having a surprise and a big report that show them that they have some mistakes. Uh, but I, I really like your answer. I, I would love to be invited to such a Dungeon and, and Dragon uh, game. Uh, so another question, not an easy one, but uh, anyway. What's the best way to use a red team for companies? Uh, again, based on your work, if, if, if you can. <laughs> Uh, like, should it be to shake, uh, to, to rattle the company's cage to show the secu that security is important? Should it be to ramp up the technology, the process, the humans? Uh, how, how do you see red teaming in, in, in the industry? Um, it's a really good question, and I think uh, a lot of times red teaming, penetration testing is misplaced. Um, it's the sexy thing to do, right? We're gonna hire some hackers and they're gonna show us how they broke in. Um, I think it's often mistimed or um, maybe not conducted in, in the right frame of mind, in the right context. Um, you know, if I did, we used an analogy earlier. If I take my five-year-old and bring her to the, to the Taekwondo uh, arena and I say, test her. <laughs> you know, wh what's the result going to be? Um, I don't know if it's a very productive exercise to just do red team engagements without first taking the, the baby steps before you're ready for it. Um, I think purple teaming is a great use of, of red team assets to, to work alongside and, and train blue teams, uh, train against each other. Um, and I, I think that red teams are a great validation tool. And w I think when you reach a certain maturity in your security organization, that's when a red team is, is really valuable. Um, but I, I think you can start with basics um, and not necessarily need a red team to, to, to introduce you to the basic best security practices all the time. Uh, would be, I guess, my opinion on that. Thank you. And it's also a, a kind of a bloated term right now. Like, everyone's a red teamer. Be mm. I don't know, man. I'm sure you're not. <laughs> and the, the, if you have a scope, are you really a red teamer, you know, type stuff? But I think this is the the definitions, and I and we don't have. Do we have a standard bodies that defines like what are these, or we're just the like the problem is that there are many definitions. If you follow Spectrops, they have their own definition of red team. If you read someone else, it's something else. I think it's a language abuse. So red team is usually used for uh, offensive security or just pen testing, ethical hacking. Uh, in my opinion, red teaming is really about uh, you know training uh, technology process humans. I, I follow more the Spectre Ops definition, so it's about simulating uh, threat actor based uh, by using several TTPs to create training opportunities for a blue team. Uh, but in the industry, it's it's used for anything. You're right. Um, yeah. Good answer, Martin. 
No, but I just want this to be clear, right? The, he is the one who should answer those questions. So this guy manages a red team at a large institution, and he, Maybe. like, I am a director of research. And uh, what about you? I um, didn't read I'm, you. I'm, I, I like red teaming stuff, but I'm not a red teamer either. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in it, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not at the caliber of either of these guys. Um, but I don't need to be to pull off an effective attack either, um, which is sort of what I was getting at, is we don't need the best hacker in the world to prove that you're, you're fundamentally insecure. So I think there's a time and a place to, to conduct these exercises. And um, again, you know, my white belt five-year-old is not going to uh, stand a chance in a sparring session against uh, <laughs> Mike Tyson. A, a trained, yeah, exactly, there you go. So I, I think context matters and time and place and asking yourself why are we hiring a red team for what, to embarrass us? Or are we doing it to actually <laughs> improve our security culture? I think that's what it comes down to. Mm. All right. That's going to so be So the mine. next red team question goes to Martin directly. <laughs> the next you want me to read it? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. Or, but or we'll uh, have like us and then you. That's nice, I think. Well, I, I, I was going to say it's my last question. We have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, but I will try to answer it. Uh, and it's uh, like the <laughs> it's the worst question because I know it will s it will raise a debate, but uh, nice. It's about red team, uh, the R T O S T debate. So red team open source tools. So a lot of people uh, care about sharing. They, they they say that sharing is caring. You should uh, publish your open source tools. Your you could both have very awesome research. Uh, it can be good. It can be good used for the good, but also for the bad. And uh, so, what do you think about publishing all your work? You said Roland before that you wouldn't publish your data, but maybe you will publish tools to accelerate your this work. Uh, so, what do you think about this debate? And would you publish uh, your your job? Um, I'm a little bit biased because I'm a net beneficiary of, of open source tools. I'm not, I'm not a net contributor. Um, I, I think there's a lot of value in open source. And, but I do, I do respect the fact that people will spend a lot of time developing techniques and, and developing tools for themselves. Um, personally, I'm on, I'm on the side of open source. I think if, if you discover a vulnerability, you should disclose it uh, in due course. I think putting tools out there that people can take advantage of, they're great learning tools, as you say. I, I tend to be on the open source side of things. Um, but again, I'm biased because I haven't spent hundreds of hours developing a tool uh, that may be obsolete uh, three days after I release it. Um, yeah, that's Thanks. my opinion. You want me to answer first? Oh, oh man, <laughs> I'm I'm a kind of a, a, a philosopher in, in my times, <laughs> and I think I think we lack perspective. Like piracy existed and was authorized or, you know, or happened without no one doing anything against it because it was, you know, all countries were separated. But then eventually the pirates did so much damage that the countries had to get together and create this international zone and then fucking kill them, you know, get rid of them because they were losing so much money. So I think we're at the era, like, like basically we're, we're creating firearms, okay? I wouldn't, like, uh, this is not Gosegur's opinion of anything. <laughs> this is my own here, okay? I think we're creating firearms, and uh, I don't think you're allowed to create firearms right now, right? I, I don't know, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I know people try to pre 3D print them, maybe we're allowed. I don't, and, and in Canada and the US, it's probably different. But... I think that we lack this perspective, so for now, we're doing it, we're having fun, but eventually, a hundred years for now, if climate change didn't kill all of us, uh, we will look at this and be like, these guys were crazy. Like, they were allowed to create destructive tools and put them online, whereas the defenders we're not sharing, right? That, that's the asymmetry of it right now. And now 
the blue team folks now are sharing, you know, Twitter accounts with IOCs automated and stuff like that. And, and there's a lot of blue team talks, good blue team talks now. When I started, that, that didn't exist. Blue team were kind of like, uh, this must, must suck. You look at IDS all day. Uh, I'm fucking the Pentest badass, you know? Now, blue team is sexy, and which is good, which is very important which is part of uh, education that, w that is going on. But they still have sharing problems because the organizations that they are in don't understand that they should share. It's not the fault of the blue teamers themselves. It's the fault of their organizations. And so this asymmetry is not helping them. And so the red team, they collaborate, they create Patreons, they have tools. You can now have like paid for offensive tooling that eventually becomes free, like the Porchetta Industries guys, which are very good. They're actually like really, really good with RDP right now and following all that stuff. Um, and at, at one point, maybe we'll be like, you know what? Like, and it will be an incident. Like something will get hacked that it's so fucking bad that we'll be like, okay, you know what? It was a bad idea. The whole thing of like, because they'll use fucking Cobalt Strike and stuff like that. And so, I, and sorry if I'm talking against you. You'll have time. You'll, ha you'll be retired <laughs> by then. But I, 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 I don't think it makes sense if you think of it from far enough. And uh, last thing, I'm, <laughs> I told you I was a philosopher, okay? So think about this. At one point, Fire protection, you had to pay for it, okay? You had a badge on your house. It was like up in with money. And if you didn't have that, the fireman would come and water the house that had the little badge, but the other house would burn, right? So eventually it became so much of an issue that it was nationalized or municipalized. Uh, I'm not sure which, but... It, like, it's, it's part of the things that we need as a society. And so I think eventually government will be so pissed off that it costs so much money to so much companies that there will be, like, you know, AV and, you know, ISP protection and security in general will be mandatory, like, built in the things. And which means that, and if it's regularized, it will, it will mean, like, anything trying to be against that will be outlawed. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just a philosopher. I should write a book. We, we just need to finish on that. That was an amazing question. So thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I wish you a lot of flags this weekend. Uh, pray with me for a Windows track, maybe. It would be fun. And uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>